Another important uh, analysis on a sequential logic circuit is the timing analysis of it. And when you think about the timing of a, of a sequential logic circuit, the key metric is usually the maximum clock rate that you can run it at. And this is different from a combinational logic circuit. So if I had combinational logic, we typically talk about the delay through it. So the worst case delay through everything. So if you recall, you might have you know, delay associated here. You have like one nanosecond for the NAND gates, two nanoseconds for the OR gate. And you try to find the worst case delay path through that. Let's say that this was two nanoseconds as an example, a different type of, of NAND gate or AND gate. And what you do is you'd say, oh, okay, I want to find out what the worst case delay is. And then that represents the the worst case, or the delay of the entire circuit. So we'd go two plus two. So the delay, the combinational logic delay, we'll go T, C, and B, was equal to four nanoseconds, okay? When you talk about a uh, state machine, though, you're gonna have a circuit that's got the flip-flops in it. And there is gonna be delay associated with a number of, uh, number of things, but it's typically in the form of, you got combinational logic driving the D inputs, you got combinational logic driving the D inputs, and these, these combinational logic Circuits are driven by some inputs, but they're also driven by some feedback from the outputs of the, the flip-flops. And it all comes down to, well, what, is, what do I care about? And you care about the clock frequency. And if you go through the analysis, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to say, okay, I have a rising edge of a clock, and that triggers everything. Yeah. And it turns out that the way that these circuits work is you start the timing analysis on the rising edge of the clock. Even if you have inputs that come from the outside world, they're going to always go through a de flip flop at some point. So ultimately, they will be synchronized to the internal system. And so when you do the analysis, what you're looking at is saying, okay, I have a rising edge of a clock, and that triggers all of the outputs of my de flip flops to change, which are driving both the inputs into a combinational logic circuit here and the feedback into another, the combinational logic circuit there. And the re way you can conceptualize this is that, just imagine that these signals are also driven off of deep flip-flops, which come from a common clock. So they're all wired to the same clock. So there's gonna be all sorts of delay that you have to wait for and consider before you can have the next rising edge of a clock. Because you can think about Okay, I'm going to clock it, <clears throat> and then all sorts of delay is going to happen. Things are going to start propagating. So you're going to have T clock to Q delay here. <clears throat> you're going to have combinational logic delay here. You're going to have, actually, you have wiring delay. And so you can think about all the data. If I wrote all the data and combined all the data on the chip at once, what would happen is it would be solid. It would be at some value. And then you would clock it, and everything would start transitioning. And it's transition, transition. This is every signal in the system. And at some point, it would then reach a value that's steady. And at that point that it's steady, you could say, well, once it's steady, once the worst case delay path in my entire circuit is done and everything is, is computed, I could have now my next edge of a clock. So in this example, I could say, well, that worked out well. But what you're really trying to do is you're saying, if this is the worst case, okay, so this is the worst case right here, I really can, can use that to set the maximum clock frequency. So I can say, well, I, I had a clock frequency or a clock edge there. Why don't I put the next clock edge maybe right here, okay? Or maybe I wanted to have a little bit of what we call margin, give yourself maybe 10% of margin, and put it right there. So then I could have said, you know what? I wanted my rising edge clock right there instead of over here, and I would then draw out a square wave that had a 50% duty cycle, and my new clock could have been something that looked like this. <clears throat> and that would be based on the delay or the analysis, the timing analysis. So that's what we're ultimately after is what is the maximum clock frequency? You can always run slower, uh, but you never want to run too fast because the worst thing you could do is what if you had a clock that transitioned here and then transitioned here? The problem with that is you've transitioned. You've, you've told these D flip-flops to update their outputs before all of the inputs to the D flip-flops have settled. So you have no idea what's going to happen, so you're going to violate all the setup the setup specifications of your deep flip-flops, and you're almost you're guaranteed that you'll go metastable, so the system won't work. Okay, so that's what the whole game is about. So now what we want to do is we want to add up all of the sources of delay, and we can do it kind of conceptually or graphically by just drawing a little timing diagram. And I'm going to say, here is my clock. 
This is the clock edge. And I want to start thinking about, that's, that's t equals zero. That's where I'm going to start, t, t equals zero. And <clears throat> what do I wait for? What am I going to do? Well, the first thing that's going to happen when you clock that is you need to wait for one t clock to q for the outputs to even be updated. So you can think about it as, so you're going to have at least one t clock to q delay, just for the flip-flops themselves. Okay? Then you're going to have <coughs> wiring delay. So just the wires themselves will have delay. And, you, and you're going to look at, you're going to try to find the worst case circuit in your system. So it's going to be the, the worst case combination of interconnect and delay. But you can just kind of generalize it by saying, I'm going to have wiring delay. And we're going to call it INT. And that stands for interconnect. Okay? So you've got to wait for the signals to propagate. Okay? So you've got to at least wait for them to propagate. So that would be stuff like this. And then you're going to have combinational logic delay. So you want to look at the worst case path of every Q was, was updated. And it's going to go through all these sum of products and products of sums or whatever combinational logic there. And we want to find out what that worst case situation is and then put it into our analysis. And we'll call it TCMB for combinational logic. Okay. So now you have all these sources of delay. So it clocked, it went from D to Q, wiring through the combination logic circuit, and now it's sitting right there. So it's at the input to the D, it just stopped moving. We still have one more thing that we want to do, and that is we need to meet the setup time of the D flip-flop. So we have to wait for it to be solid for a little bit of time. <clears throat> or we have to keep it valid for, or steady for, a, for the, at least one T setup. Now, at that moment in time, you could conceivably clock again. So you could say that I'm going to have an edge that will happen right there. There's a couple things we haven't talked about, though. <clears throat> Number one is hold time. Did you have enough hold time? Well, if you remember T clock to Q, as long as T clock to Q was greater than or equal to T hold, which is almost always the case, then you don't have to worry about hold because these outputs are inherently held for at least t clock to q. Now, they're, they're held for, in this situation, they're held for a way longer because they went through interconnect delay and all this. So this output, or this, excuse me, this input didn't have a chance to change very quickly. It had to wait for this thing to propagate all the way back. But the worst case scenario would be where you had a q that was routed really quickly back to its d. And that would be, let's say we had some other d flip-flop and really the fastest circuit you could ever have would be a, a toggle flop where you just routed it right back and you instantaneously went, and it was there. <clears throat> you might have a hold time violation. Except that if your T clock to Q is greater than T hold, it is inherently held while the input propagates to the output of the D flip flop. So what we can do is let's, we can make the assumption that this is a true. And if you look at modern D flip flops, this is true almost all the time. Okay, so we could say, I want a clock right here. So I'm going to clock right there. But that represents no margin, okay? That represents that you have absolutely no margin in your system. You are running at the, the maximum frequency, and if your clock experiences anything, any noise in the world, which moved it over even a picosecond, the thing would go metastable. And you never want to do that. So what we do is we insert this uh, concept of margin, okay? And margin is going to be exactly what it is. It's we're going to give ourselves just a little bit of wiggle room so that if we put the clock edge right here, I know that it might jump over here every once in a while just due to noise and power supply droop. It might dro jump over here every once in a while. But there's going to be kind of this, this clock edge movement or timing error. And this margin will absorb it. So it guarantees that I've got enough margin in between this point right here where I go metastable and <clears throat> this, the desired clock, okay? Now, what is margin? Margin is typically estimated as a percentage. So, you know, as an engineer, 10% is, is usually a good number to use for margin. And, and what is it 10% of? Well, it's 10% of this, okay? So this is going to be your deterministic delay. So this is what you absolutely need to wait for. And then take 10% and add it on there, okay? So if I added all these up, I could now say, well, this is where I can have my next clock edge and everything's great. So then I could just say, well, 50% duty cycle, I'll go right in between, and I will then 
transition down. And that is now the maximum, <coughs> that is a picture of the maximum clock rate. So how do you calculate it? Well, it's simply the period of the clock, so this would be the minimum period, is going to be nothing more than t clock to q plus t interconnect plus t combinational plus t setup, I'll just leave it as an s, plus t margin. Margin is going to be calculated on all of those, so there you go. Then you say, well, what's the frequency max? Well, frequency max is going to be 1 over t minimum, and that is, has units of hertz in it. Okay? Okay. So that's, <coughs> that's great. Let's do an example. Okay, so let's take an example. And let's say that I was given this circuit again. So this is the, the circuit we're analyzing. And we're given a few things. Okay? We're given, somebody analyzed like the interconnect delay and all that sorts of delay through the gates. And we were given this. <coughs> Number one, the setup and hold of the D flip-flops was found to be 0.5 nanoseconds. Okay? The clock to Q delay of it was one nanosecond. So those were the D flip-flop timing characteristics. The exclusive OR gates in the circuit had a delay of four nanoseconds. The AND gates had a delay of one nanosecond. The OR gates had a delay of two nanoseconds. <clears throat> then it was found that interconnect was 0.5 nanoseconds for all pass. So it was kind of like this generalized, somebody said, oh, they, they're all about the same, but they do take 0.5 nanoseconds. <clears throat> and then what we want to do is we want to insert 10% margin. Okay, we want to do 10% margin. So how do we do this? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is, is look at the hold time violation and say, do we have a problem? We do not, because T clock to Q is greater than T hold, so the hold time will be inherently met just because you're waiting for the D flip-flop outputs to be updated anyway. All right, well, that's fine. So now let's take a look at <clears throat> the worst case combinational logic path. So we have two combinational logic circuits here we have to look at. One is an exclusive OR gate. One of them is the sum of products. This path right here is 4 nanoseconds. This path right here is going to be 1 nanosecond for the AND gate and then 2 nanoseconds for the OR gate. So its total is going to be 3 nanoseconds. So which one do we use in our analysis? Well, we use 4 nanoseconds because it's the worst. Okay, so it's the worst case. So now we can take our deterministic delay <coughs> and we can add it together. And let's first come up with a number for margin. Okay, so margin is what we'll start with. <coughs> and let's take a look at how we'd add that together. So our margin is going to be all the deterministic delay. We're going to have T clock to Q plus T combinational plus T interconnect plus T setup. And I'm going to multiply it by 0.1 to get 10%. So when I plug in my real numbers, I've got the clock to Q delay was one nanosecond of the D flip-flop. Let me try to get that on the screen there. Was, was one nanosecond. There we go. And then the combinational logic delay with the worst case was four nanoseconds, which was the path through the exclusive OR gate. The interconnect delay, they said for all paths, was 0.5 nanoseconds. And then the setup specification of the D flip-flops was 0.5 nanoseconds. Those added together come up to be, <coughs> what do you get? Five, five and a half, six. So six nanoseconds. Multiply it by 0.1 and you get 0.6 nanoseconds. So that's our margin. So then all that's really left to do is to add all those together in order to come up with the minimum period and invert it in order to get the frequency. So the frequency is going to be this right here, this uh, denominator is the period, <coughs> T clock to Q plus T combinational plus T interconnect plus T setup plus margin. So one nanosecond, four nanoseconds, 0.5 nanoseconds, 0.5 nanoseconds, and then our margin, 0.6, you add all those up together, one over, and you get a unit or a number in hertz. So this circuit can run at 151 megahertz. Okay, so that's, whoops, that's the analysis that we did. Now, <clears throat> do you have to run at 151 megahertz? No. If you go faster than that, what happens? You do, you do this thing called overclocking. You're trying to run it faster. You run the risk of going metastable because you might pull a clock in edge in too close to the prior clock edge and the, the data has not settled yet. So you're in danger if you go above that. Now you have a little bit of margin in there, so you know you could maybe squeak out a couple more megahertz, but this, is, this represents the, the safe maximum frequency. You can always run slower, it's not going to hurt anything, but that's how you do the timing analysis on that sequential logic circuit. <coughs>